the, the Anglo-Saxon psychology, historical psychology that we're creating here, all of the people of Europe who you think of as being, frankly, ridiculous, are all Catholics. But I've noticed, uh, since paranoia is one of my, uh, my hobbies, uh, I, I remember a few years ago, an, an interesting, uh, this is going to be probably, the sarcasm will probably be bothersome to people, but it occurred to me that if you look at the way certain groups are presented in Anglo-Saxon, I mean, literally British and American culture, there's an interesting pattern to it. F whether it be we're talking about the English or the Americans, the French are effete, They've always lost all the wars. The Americans had to save them in World War I and save them in World War II. Yep. Uh, the British really are their superior in every way. The French are just really silly people. They drink a lot of wine and, and they dress peculiarly and they're feet. Uh, the Italians are ridiculous. They wave their hands around a lot and they've never really accomplished anything except for the Roman Empire. But we usually <laughs> forget about that. And uh, they're basically emotional, silly people uh, mm. who eat food that you really don't want to eat. There's caricatures, yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so the French are secondary. The, the, the Italians are secondary. Uh, the Poles are stupid. And we, for a generation, we were told that. Yeah, you know, the first joke I ever remember learning as a child was how do you get a one-armed Polish man to fall out of a tree? <laughs> Wave. <laughs> well, some of these are funny, but it's... it's but, but why is that? I mean, even... I know that you've talked about mm. in, in some of your work. Sure. Well, uh, uh, we, I want to get into this later as we talk about the film, but the genesis of this anti-Polish sentiment in the United States, and in Western culture, probably. But... Um, you know, this is when this is. I'm talking about the '80s. That's right. And That's and right. I'm Polish. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah yes. I'm, 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 my my grandfather looked just like John Paul II. My my mother's maiden name was um, Kuzic or Kuzic. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so so, and you know, I'd laugh at the joke, but then say, wait, wh why are Polish people right. stupid? What do you mean That's right, by yeah. that? But in in a in a if we contextualize the Poles, uh, note what we're doing. What the, the Anglo-Saxon psychology, historical psychology that we're creating here, mm -hmm. all of the people of Europe who you think of as being, frankly, ridiculous, are all Catholics. Hmm. Who were the brutes who created the in, uh, Inquisition and slaughtered people in vast numbers, these cruel, dark, Jesuitical Spaniards? Right. At the same time, of course, the British were killing of people in their own country in numbers that are quite, some estimates would say in the late 16th century, the British killed 20,000 Catholics and 50,000 Lutherans. The Spanish did nothing like that. So who are the real religious butchers in Europe? The English. Hmm. So do you think this is because, uh, extending even today, uh, British imperialism has controlled the narrative? Uh, I think it's, in. I think the, the religious guidance of Anglo-Saxons, whether they be English or Americans, is practicality. Mm -hmm. And they see Italians, Spaniards, Poles, the Irish, of course, are worthless drunks. They mm -hmm. see them all as, as frivolous and silly who well, must be controlled. Well, they're not emotional, no, they're the not. British. No, not at all. And Catholics do have space That's right. for the passions. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And I think there's a, there is a very profoundly embedded notion that if you are from the rims of uh, European culture, you're either from the British Isles or across the ocean in America, Canada, and of course Australia, New Zealand, and going the other direction, you are a person who is capable of really anything because you have practical values, you have focus, you have managerial skills, et cetera, et cetera, and therefore you have a right to be the leaders of Western civilization. The other members of Western civilization are simply, they're almost clowns. Mm. And although, as uh, Churchill once said about the French, they've invented a lot of cheeses, uh, th the whole idea is these are, they have their, their, their good moments, but basically, hmm. they're, they're not. They're not. And that's why making fun of Poles, making fun of Italians, looking upon Irish as stupid drunks, hmm. calling Frenchmen cowards, when what you're saying is absolutely wrong. Hmm. It, it's just, it's, it's not true yeah but you're saying it why because you need to say that to yourself isn't there something though that's attractive from a male perspective about the stiff upper stiff upper lip yeah. of the, of the british culture 
of, of the uh, the regular. It's almost it's a Aristotelian, isn't it? It's the control of the passions. It's mm -hmm. the it's the capacity to modulate what I'm feeling and be stable and secure and not let not let ourselves be drowned mm. by the emotional life. Mm -hmm. So I think there is like I'm James Bond. Mm. I mean, is is stoic in a way. No, you like this. And, and uh, emotions are associated with the feminine, mm -hmm. typically. Mm -hmm. Now we could unpack that quite a bit, mm -hmm. but um, I, I do think there's almost like a superficial attraction to British culture and the British way of looking at things. Maybe just for Americans, and that's why we have the cowboy, right? You know, it's it's the stoic uh, Clint Eastwood type that yes. is it, that doesn't feel, it doesn't emote, and then we have the the masculine construct that permeates all of society. I mean, boys don't cry. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's still common. And mm -hmm. there's, a, there's pushback against that now, and in some ways it's gone too far. Mm -hmm. But there's no virtue in the mean of this integration, the integrated self of listening to the emotions, letting them move you, their locomotive, mm -hmm. right? But you don't let them make decisions for you either. Mm -hmm. You do, it's, it is Aristotelian, it's the rider on the horse. Mm -hmm. You listen to the horse, you, you, you're, tr you're kind to the horse, but, but you don't let the horse drive you off a cliff, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you are in control ultimately. Um, not to use the word poles again, but I think people are drawn to poles and have difficulty with both hands. It's very Catholic to consider the both hand. Mm -hmm. Christ is fully God mm -hmm. and he's fully man, mm -hmm. right? It's we're saved by faith and works. You know, the, the both hand is, is hard for our mind. Oh, yes. And we, we tend to shift one way or the other. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, I, I, I agree. I, I think uh, uh, it, it seems to me that there are aspects of uh, Anglo-Saxonness which are purposely and consciously, uh, perhaps increasingly unconsciously, uh, it's propaganda. Hmm. It's propaganda. It is to present a picture of the Anglo-Saxon people by which they are always not only virtuous, but they really are always victorious. Hmm. The others have their moments, to be sure. But in the long run, it's the practicality, the good sense, the managerial skills, what the British called positivism in the mid-19th uh, mid century, the philosophical doctrine behind capitalism. Uh, all these things seem to be nothing more than common sense. Capitalism, after all, is a much better system than socialism because mm. socialism doesn't work. It's just it basically it's another way of getting towards tyranny. Mm. So that's just foolish. So uh, you have capitalism, and capitalism requires democracy to make capitalism more functional, and capitalism is based on the presupposition of positivism. Now, that all sounds fine until you realize what is the ultimate next step if you follow this process? Atheism. Right. Atheism. Yeah, positivism sp yes. specifically. Yes. Yeah. If you look at the major proponents of positivism in the 19th century, whether it be Darwin, for instance, or wh whether it be Spencer, yeah. uh, all of them, even some, they, some of them simply lied. They're all atheists. Yes, they're all atheists. Yes, and they saw religious faith as being darkness, and the people were were cloaked in darkness because they're too stupid to realize that they're being held back you know, by faith. Yeah. And only when they jettison faith will they be able to, to climb the hills of progress and be liberated, enlightened, <laughs> enlightened in some way. Yes, and that's why, of course. What what do you want to be? Well, you want to stop being Catholic because Catholicism is stupid. Mm -hmm. You can't be Orthodox because the Orthodox are simply Halloween creatures. They're just ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to do Bells that. and smells and all that, yeah. It's, it's just nonsense. Uh, Protestantism is okay for a while as long as it's cooperative. It's neat and tidy. and uh, That's right. Yeah. That's right. And you can, you can fool with it on the edges. Yeah. Uh, and then you have what you really want, which is Anglo-Saxonism. So in order to make sure that people don't think it's a, a lousy version of being a Frenchman, yeah. what you do is you simply remaster history so it comes out with you're the good guys. Right, so so th this to me makes sense from a, from a British perspective. But the complicating fact is that Americanism is a watered down and a version of, of an Anglo-Saxon yes. viewpoint mm -hmm. and it's increasingly uh, uh, less British <laughs> as, ti as time goes on, in mm -hmm. fact. Well, British is less British. What's that? I say British is less British. British is less British, you're right. But I mean, I, as I said before, I could never identify with American history because mm -hmm. it didn't feel like my history as a Catholic. Um, but 
I mean, you're you are Polish. And, I'm and a Pole. There's ident identity, and I'm sure you're you're a Polish citizen. I'm, I'm sure, right? Yes, yes. But you're Amer you're an American citizen. Yes. Right. So it's getting more and more complicated in terms of what it means to be American. You can't draw a straight line from the average American to this Anglo-Saxon tradition anymore. It's I think it's at a it's foundational. There's there's uh, especially puritanistic mm -hmm. types of uh, sentiments and philosophies and implications and all that is in, in, embedded in the way we look at the world. But what do you make of the fact that you're also American? How, how do you make sense of your American identity? I'm a Paul identity. who was born in America. That's where I'll end the sentence. That's the end of it. That's the end of it. So you don't identify with, with American culture? No. Hmm. No. Uh, when I uh, I don't dislike the Americans, and I uh, what what I always say is this: I was born and raised in the United States. I know the United States quite well. Mm -hmm. I obey American laws. I pay American taxes. Whenever I'm abroad, which is quite often, I always defend the United States against mm -hmm. those who would attack it. Sure. Because I think the United States is, has uh, many virtues, and they should be properly presented and defended. Mm -hmm. But it's the land of opportunity. We're here doing this right. right now. But. Uh, as a risk of being excessively emotional, my heart is in Poland. Mm. And whenever I go to Poland, the first thing I do is I say, whether I'm alone or with one of my family members, we're home. We're home. That's home. This does not feel like home. It never has. This is a hotel. Mm. I wonder how many Americans feel that way. I don't know. I think more Poles, and not only Poles, Italians, Frenchmen, Irishmen, uh, really are more French, Italian, Irish, and Polish than they want to admit to. American, yes, I yeah. think I, I think this this hyphenate business, Polish Americans. I I will never use that word. I don't like it. It's so complicated though, because it's complicated because of the blending. I mean, yeah. I my my I, I'm not purely one or the other. Sure, and uh, I do ha identify with the cultural heritage of multiple, of course, European states. Of course, and uh, it's hard to get behind one particular just sort of national bent of course you know and and I think that's most Americans and then with each generation there's more of a a mixture and right. something that is becoming like unadulterated Americanism mm -hmm. is now rising to the top well it's an interesting uh, paradox and that is assimilation, whether we're talking about the United States or we're talking about Bulgaria. Assimilation is inevitable. Mm -hmm. If you move into a, a culture that was originally not your own, in order to function successfully, you have to understand that culture and function within the confines of that culture. If you don't, you're a failure. Right. Mm -hmm. So therefore, uh, learning how to be Bulgarian, if you're from Serbia, is necessary to be successful and to be at, at, at peace. Yes. So assimilation is, is simply good sense. I understand that. But uh, recent studies on immigration history have indicated that people in the fourth generation, usually it's referred to as the fourth generation phenomenon. Yeah, sure. It occurs, they're, they're disturbed because in, in, the, in their- They're the, divided? They're, in, they're, they're looking for rootedness. Hmm. What am I? Am, yes. I? am I nothing? Yes. And a lot of these people want to travel back to Norway yes. or to uh, France or to Greece because my great grandfather was from there and his name was so and so yes. and that's my that's what I originally that's, that's was where, that's, that's where I belong where, that's where I belong or at least that's what makes me me yeah because if you're not me and you're just nothing I don't think it's enough no I no. don't think it's enough. I think a person has to feel, you can say, well, what about his faith? Can't you say, I don't care whether I'm French or Italian. I'm a Catholic. And that's enough. Well, maybe it should be. 